Well, welcome to our first session, our first catechism study group session. We're going to be looking at this excellent little book, it gets in focus, the Revised Catechism of the Church of England. It really is excellent and it's only 12 pages. And in this study group, we're going to be thinking about this book, which was prepared as a way of helping to introduce people to the teachings and the faith of the Church of England. Documents like the Revised Catechism have been prepared for hundreds of years, primarily as a way of um, helping people to prepare for their baptism and their confirmation. You may even have used the, um, the Book of Common Prayer Catechism as part of your own conf confirmation preparation when you were younger. The Revised Catechism sets out to expand the Book of Common Prayer Catechism and to update it, um, which in short means it's a really good thing and really worth studying. Um, the first section that we're going to be looking at concerns five questions relating to the Christian calling. And those questions are, what is your Christian name? Who gave you this name? What did God do for you at your baptism? What did your godparents promise for you at your baptism? Are you bound to do as they have promised? Now, those questions might all seem really, really straightforward. And you might think, well, golly, if this is how Christian theology starts, then it's going to be a doddle. But I think you'll find, not that it's not going to be a doddle, it's going to be hopefully interesting and, and uh, fulfilling, but that in these rather basic questions, there is something very significant to open out and to understand in terms of the faith for us and how we might live. Despite the simplicity then of these questions, they cut to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Why is it then that the Catechism starts with this apparently insignificant question of your name? What is your Christian name? Surely no Christian truth can be conveyed in the fact that we were named by somebody at some time. The truth is, though, that our name is incredibly important because it means that we are called by God as an individual. We're called as someone who is known by God. The smallest details of our life are a book which is wide open to him. Every single aspect of who we are is fully known by God before even it began to express itself in our personality. And as Jesus Christ says in the Gospels, um, even though um, the tiniest bird doesn't fall to the ground without God's knowing, nevertheless, we are of much more importance than many birds. And so God knows us and cares for us and knows us in the details of our lives, which are, as I said, an open book to him. The 139th Psalm speaks really beautifully about this. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down art acquainted and art acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou dost beset me behind and before and layest thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in shale, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to thee. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with thee. For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise thee, for thou art fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are thy works. Thou knowest me right well, my frame was not hidden from thee when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Thy eyes beheld my unformed substance. In thy book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are thy thoughts, O God! 
how vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Every aspect of my life then, every single bit of who I am, is known by Almighty God. And every gift that I have, every gift that I've received, flows from his goodness. We are bound together in a network of human relationships to the parents, the godparents who named us, and that network of friends and acquaintances who have formed us to a certain degree to be the people we are. But behind all of this is God's purpose for our lives, his gifting and the pouring out of his love and his goodness into us. And so in that first question, that very first tiny question, what is your name? What is it that you are what is it that you're called? Lies this sense in which everything that we are lies open to the God who calls us and longs for us to live in communion with him. The Christian faith, however, teaches that despite our dependence on God and our origins in the creative expression of his goodness, nevertheless we wander from the source of that goodness. We seek to find goodness and delight in lesser goods. And so in the third question of the Catechism, what did God do for you in your baptism, we read this answer. In my baptism, God called me to himself and I was made a member of Christ, the child of God, an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. In baptism, in your baptism, um, in my baptism, in our baptism, we begin a journey whose end is finding all our delight and fulfilment in knowing and loving God. God calls us to himself, and this is the primary vocation of every single Christian, indeed, of every single human being. Unfortunately, when we speak about vocation or calling, we tend to think first and foremost about being called to some kind of official ministry within the church, to being a, a lay reader or a deacon or a priest or, heavens, even a bishop, I suppose. Even they might, must feel in some way called to doing what, whatever it is that they do. But the primary language of calling is something far more encompassing. God doesn't just call certain human beings. God calls all human beings to find our chief delight in him. But what does delighting in God look like? Well, certainly it involves taking delight in knowing God through worship and through prayer and through study of scripture. But can we put any more flesh on this idea? This brings us to the fourth and fifth questions of the Catechism. Question four, what did your godparents promise for you at your baptism? And question five, are you bound to do as they promised? The answer to these questions, I think, are really, really important. Answer to question four. At my baptism, my godparents made three promises for me. First, that I would renounce the devil and fight against evil. Secondly, that I would hold fast the Christian faith and put my whole trust in Christ as Lord and Saviour. And thirdly, that I would obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and serve him faithfully all the days of my life. Now, we could just read these answers as suggesting that it is a Christian duty, it's the duty of all Christians, to live a good life. And of course, it is our duty to live a good life, obedient to God and trusting in Christ. But there's more here. Because in these three answers, we find that growing closer to God, growing into a closer union with the God who loves us, involves a change in who we are, a change in our lives. As we grow in nearness to the God who made us, our lives become increasingly drawn away from the things which draw us away from God. Our lives become more aligned to Jesus Christ, who shows us what true humanity looks like and who died for us so that we could be freed to cling to God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Our lives are characterised then by following the precepts of God. We are called, in other words, to become saints. 
Now that might seem an extreme thing to say. Surely the saints are those courageous individuals who've battled against tyrants and suffered martyrdom and done all sorts of incredible things, performed miracles, gone to the uttermost parts of the earth to spread the faith, um, who um, have done amazing things in the name of Christ. But the Catechism paints a much more mundane picture of sanctity. The saints are those who have, through perseverance, with repentance for the times that they get things wrong, pushed forwards in clinging to Jesus Christ and in following God's commandments. That is what God calls us to be, to be his saints. Now we might think that a call of this magnitude is too great for us. And indeed, in our own strength, it would be, which is why the answer to the fifth question of the Catechism, as small as it is, is so profound. Are you bound to do as they promised? Yes, certainly, and by God's help, I will. We're not only called to know and love God through our baptism, we are bound to follow the commitments which were made for us by our godparents. But in our baptism, God doesn't only bind us to himself, he binds himself to us. He binds himself to us in a covenant, a contract, if you like, by which he promises to provide the grace, the energy, the impetus by which we will persevere in our faith and live in the knowledge and love of God. And so we acknowledge in the Catechism that to follow God's commandments, to always fight against evil, to remain faithful to Christ, is something we can't do in our own strength. And yet, with the help of God, we will persevere. So in these five rather basic questions, we can see the foundations of what it means to be a Christian. We are not just called to go to church, but to um, live a distinctive life. We're not just called to be Christians on a Sunday, but to otherwise be indistinguishable from the world, from anyone else. We're called to place God at the centre of our existence. We're called to find our greatest del delight in knowing and loving God. We're called to show our knowledge and love of God through a transformed life and through that transformed life to radiate the goodness, love and light of God into the world around us. Well, hopefully that's given you enough to think about in this first session, some really important things that these five very simple questions of the Revised Catechism help us to think about and to meditate on. I hope that's given you plenty to think about. I'm really looking forward to discussing with it, this with you at some point. If you want to join in the discussion on the Revised um, uh, Catechism of the Church of England, please do drop me a line. My email address is rector, R-E-C-T-O-R, at Clandon hyphen churches dot org and um, I'll make sure that you're included in the zoom discussion but really good to be with you and I'll look forward to speaking to you all soon thanks very much <laughs>